join me. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And we dare not trust the sweetest frame of mind or good intention or deep theological understanding or good work for our neighbor. We dare not trust in anything aside from you, Lord. Just you your righteousness, your goodness, your holiness, your love. Thank you for this time. Use it for your glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I am to speak to you tonight about the topic of the grace we demonstrate. And it's my joy to do that. What I want to try to unpack for you is a way to think about how grace transforms us so that we can demonstrate grace to others. So how does the gospel of grace speak to us? How does that good news that we have been undeservedly loved we have been undeservedly loved. How does that speak to us as we seek to obey the two commandments, to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself? How does, how does the good news that we have been loved immeasurably by the only person who actually knows us he actually knows you. You know, Phil and I, we know each other. We've been married for 40-something years. Whenever anybody asks Phil, how long have you been married, he always says, not long enough. Now, that's a sweet thing, isn't it? But he does that because I'm not sure that he actually knows. <laughs> but I think it's 43, which actually proves that there is a God, that we could be married for 43 years. And um, so how does, how does the gospel help me love Phil? And how, how does the truth that the God who knows me, knows me better than Phil does, and actually sees the train wreck that goes on in my heart, he actually loves me. How does that change me, transform me, motivate me to love my neighbor? So how does the gospel of grace speak to us? Well, as we heard so eloquently already, um, what matters most about us is first of all that we've been created in the image of God and that truth that we heard was so important and I'm so thankful for that. Um, what, does the, what, does, what does that truth tell me? It tells me that I am beloved already because I have been created in the image of God. It also the gospel of grace also makes a statement about our need. It teaches me that I am created in the image of God, but I'm also fallen, and it teaches me about my need. First of all, it frees us to admit and confess our sin. Um, I'm pretty well done listening to anybody that doesn't feel comfortable confessing sin. Now, that may or may not matter to anyone, <laughs> but it, if you don't know you're a sinner, then I'm not sure I want to hear from you. So, the more time we spend in the gospel, thinking about the gospel, 
the more able we are to admit and confess our sin. And not just a sort of a generic, I'm not perfect, <laughs> understatement of the century. I'm not perfect, or even not just a generic, I'm a sinner like everyone else. Oh yeah, we're all sinners, but specific sins. Being comfortable, not in the fact that I sin, but in the reality that I continually fail to do the two things I've been told to do. I mean, my mom would make a list. She'd say, I only got two things on it. You can't just do those. Yeah, I can't even do those two things. Love God with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbor as myself. I'm to do that 24 hours a day of my entire life. So not just that I fail to do that, but there are specific ways that I fail to care about or understand my neighbor and his needs. For instance, I admit that I have not cared about the truth or justice that should have impacted me because I live in a community that's 85% Hispanic. And I've never thought about how systematic, systemic oppression has impacted them. I've never even thought about it. I have been completely blind to white privilege. See, we're Americans, and for those of us who have bought into the American dream, um, what we think is everything I have, I have because I worked hard to get it. And so, if you would just work hard, like me, then you would have it too. Isn't that what we think as Americans? It's what I think, that I, I've worked hard. I, I mean, a man, I deserve, I deserve everything I've earned. And yet, <laughs> I'm completely blind in saying that, first of all, to the fact that as a white Woman in Southern California, I have certain privileges that other people don't have. I'm completely blind to that. And I'm also completely blind to the reality that the truth is that everything I have is a gift of grace. See, our American way of thinking, that if you work hard, you can make it, completely discounts the grace of God that he has poured out on my life. And the numbers of times before I even came to faith, when I should have died or should have been in jail, that he saved me. Completely blind to that. Completely blind to all the goodness that God has poured out on me. That American ideal of if you work hard enough, you'll be able to do anything is as anti-grace as you can possibly get. How does the gospel of grace speak to us further? It reveals our need for a savior. You know, Abraham, you remember the story, he tried to find 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he was unable to do so. Jeremiah was challenged to find one righteous person in Jerusalem so that God would spare the city. This is what it says in Jeremiah. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. Look and take note. Search her squares to see if you can find a man, one, one, who does justice and seeks truth that I may pardon her. And so Jeremiah goes and he looks at the poor. And he says, well, no, these are just the poor. I'll go to the great. And he doesn't find anyone there. And then he goes to the prophets, and he doesn't find anyone there. This is what God says to Jeremiah about the city. This is the city that must be punished, for there is nothing but oppression within her. For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. Now, listen. 
Okay, all right, that's Jerusalem. But let me just tell you something. That's not just ancient Jerusalem, and it's not just the Jerusalem of Jesus' day. It's now. It's here and now. Look around for one person, one person who is wholly committed to his neighbor's good. Wholly committed to his neighbor's good. Brothers and sisters, this is the law. And the law is good and righteous and holy, and it's meant to be doing something to you right now. What else does the gospel of grace do, and how else does it speak to us? It reveals God's heart in that we have a Savior. Listen, you need a Savior. Do you know you need a Savior? I mean, have you ever... Have you ever just sort of wanted something somebody else had? You know, just sort of a little kind of mm, covetousness there, that thing? See, you're done. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. It's perfect obedience or it's over. God demands perfect obedience. And... What that's meant to do to you is make you flee to Jesus with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Run to Christ. Flee to him that God's love for us as ungodly, weak enemies who oppress our neighbors is unflagging. His love for us is unflagging even when we continue to sin, teaches us that his love can overcome and bring to nothing all sin. That's what he's going to do. He's going to bring to nothing all sin. He's done it in Christ and on the new earth. He will do it. That day we're all longing for up here, that day is coming. That day is coming on the new earth. See, we have a Savior. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I mean, you know, think about that. (laughs) Nothing can or will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Mm. What else does... The gospel of grace. How else does it speak to us? It frees us to receive and even pursue painful instruction, correction, and even confrontation from others whose perspective and experiences we may be unconsciously or even consciously blind to. See, what that does, the thought that God loves me even though I sin. What that does for me is it frees me from all of my defensiveness. It frees me from the desire to try to prove that I'm really okay. I'm really all right. That's why I'm standing up here and saying to you, I'm not okay. So let's all of us together run to Jesus and admit our great need, our great need of a Savior, and and I can be free now. Brothers and sisters, we can be free to admit that we're wrong. Right? You can be free to admit that. Why? Because you don't have to defend yourself anymore. See, because you've already been criticized more on Calvary than I could ever criticize you. You all, us all, all y'all are so bad, God had to die to redeem you. That's, that's That's where we're at. So then I don't have to try to build this identity of like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm all that. I'm all good. I'm okay. Oh, I'm not, I'm, there's not a racist cell in my body. 
I don't have to build that. Now, that doesn't mean that, like, I just don't care. Of course I care because I'm commanded to love my neighbor. And because Jesus loved his neighbor, then I want to love my neighbor. But the reality is I don't have to wear masks anymore. I don't have to do that. I am able to admit my unworthiness to be loved. That's so freeing. It, you know what? It's just you can stop pretending. What would a day be like if you went through the whole day without pretending at all? Wouldn't that be great? I am free to admit my unworthiness to be loved because I am secure in his unearned love for me. Now, listen, that doesn't mean that I never fight for to try to defend myself or prove that I'm something wonderful. Of course I do. But then when I'm in my right mind, I remember, oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm already loved. And I'm actually really loved by the person who actually knows me. And he's already said nothing will separate me from his love. Nothing will separate me from his love. So I don't have to pretend anymore. And it frees me to love people who are flawed and may have a skewed understanding of my experience in the same way that I want them to love and understand me. So I can love other people. See, how do, how do I love someone who I think is, is wrong? I just think you're wrong. How do I love that person? I love that person because Jesus Christ has demonstrated God's love for me all of these years, over and over and over and over again, all of the times, <laughs> myriads of times, Jeremiah 2.32, my people have forgotten me days without number. And yet, and yet, he continues to love. He continues to love me. And therefore, when Phil, sorry, honey, when Phil sins against me, then I'm free from trying to demand something from him. I'm free to give to him. Why? Because I've been loved. I've been forgiven. And that's how it plays out. So how does the love of God transform your ability to love your neighbor? Well, first of all, let me just say this. It makes me the, a kind of person who can listen to what you have to say without having to build all sorts of defenses to keep you out. The incarnation, Christmas, God taking on human flesh, God the second person of the Trinity, Jesus the Son becoming human, demonstrates God's willingness to share in the experience of humanity. I want to just let that soak a little. God, the Son, was willing to share in the experience of what it's like to be you and I. He didn't merely observe us or read stories about our brokenness to try to understand. In fact, instead, he allowed himself to be broken by our brokenness and entered fully into it, wholly becoming one of us. One of us. He could walk into this room and you would not know it because he's going to look just like you. And oh, by the way, brothers and sisters, he'll be brown. And he'll walk in, he could walk in here, and you wouldn't notice him. Because he just looks like a normal guy. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. He knows what it's like to live your life 
That's why he took on flesh. He was hungry. He was tired. He felt hot. He felt pain. He cried. He longed for friendships. He's just like you. And he never gave in to sin, which you might think made life easier for him. It actually made it harder. Because you know what it's like when you're being tempted to do something and you finally give in. Okay, boy, glad that's over. No, actually, he never did. So the incarnation demonstrates God's willingness to share in the experience of humanity. The sinful life of Jesus demonstrates God's character. One of love for his neighbor, especially those who were oppressed and poor. And that means us. You know, (laughs) Jesus is like born in this backwater hick village. and And he's born into a group of people that are being oppressed. They are the oppressed. He wants you to know that he knows what it's like. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. You want to get blown away? Here you go. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. I mean, think about that. Seriously? Somebody doesn't look at me right, and they're going to get it. You know? Tempted to tell a story, but I shan't. (coughs) All right. (laughs) Yesterday, <laughs> yes, now you're egging me on, I'm trying, I'm tr- yesterday we took, I took my grandchildren, we took our grandchildren, we dropped them off at the airport in Jacksonville, and we're driving away from the airport, and there's a speed trap there, I mean there's a speed trap, and unfortunately, we didn't notice it on ways beforehand. And we went, you know, we weren't even going that fast. Who even knows how fast you're supposed to? You were just trying to get away from the airport. <laughs> and so, of course, we get pulled over. Now, Phil is kind. And so the police is, they're trying to get him to pull over. But he doesn't know, you know, we don't even know where we are. And so Phil sort of pulls around the block and, and stops. And, and the policeman... Mr. Police Man, <laughs> he was so snotty. <laughs> Can you believe I'm saying this? <laughs> he was bad. Uh, and I'm sitting in the back. <laughs> I, won't, I won't say what I said. But, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, he's not treating us properly with respect. And actually, we had a conversation about how glad we were at that point that we had white privilege. I'm just saying. Because this guy would have loved nothing better. (sighs) Listen, I know in my heart of hearts, I know that what he's doing is a good. See, God ordains powers. God ordains the magistrate for the punishment of evildoers. I'm not convinced that that was an evil doing, but okay. I know he's ordained by God, but boy, he wasn't very nice. He wasn't polite. So how do I respond, right? How I'm supposed to respond is, thank you. Thank you for serving us the way you do. It's exactly how I didn't respond. <laughs> but fortunately, I was sitting in the back. <laughs> I have no idea how I got there. All right. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. I mean, have you ever done that in your life? When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So when you're reviled, can you not revile in return? The love of God transforms me to love my neighbor because of Christ's substitutionary death. You know, the crucifixion was, in essence, a public lynching. It's what it was. It was the powerful people of the day 
exercising power over an oppressed people. He demonstrated his complete, listen, Jesus demonstrated his complete identification with the oppressed and unjustly condemned outcast. And so he completely identifies with that person, but he also, he also prays for forgiveness for the proud oppressor. Wait, what? He changed suffering forever by willingly entering into it for us. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. See, that's, that's what he calls us to do, to lay down our lives for the sheep. His resurrection proves that although I have failed to love my neighbor as I should, and you can all say, amen, us too. His resurrection proves that although we have failed to love our neighbor as we should, we have his record of having laid down his life for all mankind, those who were oppressed and those who were the oppressors. That's your record. See, the resurrection, Romans 4.25 says that Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. He was delivered up for all of the times I failed to love my neighbor, and he was raised for my justification. And what does justification mean? It first of all means just as if I never... Nice. So clean record. Clean record. You're forgiven for every time you oppressed your neighbor. You're forgiven for every time you failed to love. You're forgiven. But that's not all. It's not just, just as if I never sinned. It's also just as if I always... Oh, yeah, you got to say that a little louder, okay? So it's not just as if I never sinned. It's also just as if I had always obeyed. That's your record. I mean, it's, come on, right? That's your record. That's your record. You have the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ who laid down his life for his sheep. He willingly laid it down for us. That's your record right now. You have the record of loving your neighbor. What does that do? It frees me to love you. It frees me. Because I no longer have to keep count of, you know, who's doing more in this relationship. I don't have to do that anymore. I'm free from that. His ascension and promised return. See, these are all parts of the good news, right? The incarnation and sinless life and substitutionary death and bodily resurrection and ascension and promised return and renewal to set up an earthly kingdom demonstrates God's resolute determination. God has a resolute determination to fill the new earth with people who will bring the treasures of their cultures into it to beautify it forever. You wonder if, like, that sounds weird. At least got a verse for that. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Revelation 21, 24 through 26. By its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth. T'Challa. The kings of the earth, three people understood what I was talking about. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. The glory of Wakanda the glory of the United States, the glory of Sweden, the glory of... 
they will bring their glory, the glories of their cultures, which is why it's so wrong for us to tell people that if you want to come to our church, then you're, you're welcome, but your culture has to stay out. That's wrong. That in, in every way we do that, we are failing to look forward to the new kingdom. In the new kingdom, there will be all the riches of all the cultures. They will be brought into the new kingdom. And we're all going to love it. And, by the way, if you look like me, and we're going to have our DNA, if you look like me, you're going to be in a minority there. But it'll be okay. You'll be happy about it. These people over here are laughing. <laughs> After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation. How did he know that? Because they looked like they were from every nation. From all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to God! And to the Lamb. So, in the meantime... I'm stirred to pursue justice and truth, knowing that God is both just and our justifier. God is both just and our justifier, and he will continue to love me no matter how I fail. But does that mean I should try to fail? No, it just means I am. I will. So, I long to fulfill Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord, he has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice? Over the last year, I have been absolutely shocked about how many passages in Scripture have to do with justice. It's as though I have been completely blind. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God? Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous but sinners. So God requires, desires our good. And what is good? The love of God and love, a love of neighbor. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. And the only way you can get around that is that if you say that some group of people is not a brother or a human. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. We are called to do justice. Doing justice starts my brothers and sisters, with sitting and listening and validating others' experience of injustice. In other words, don't just go out and think you're going to fix it, which is what I want to do. Okay, just, you know, tell me the five things and I'll do them. No, actually, you need to mourn for a season. And that's not anti-gospel, brothers and sisters. I'm taking seriously the fact that I am forgiven and I am loved and I am righteous and I mourn my sin. At the same time, both and. It also means working toward a more just society through prayer and purposeful, holy relationships and humble community action. 
because of Jesus' incarnational suffering. You see, Jesus was incarnated into this world of suffering. So then I need to ask, how can I enter into suffering that hasn't come to me out of love and the desire to do justice? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We're in need and we need God's grace. Now, some people may say that's not the place of the church. Doing justice is not the place of the church. But then, why do we fight for the unborn or for biblical definitions of gender and marriage. Justice for the oppressed is no less significant than these other more popular causes. No less significant. So, what, well, at least are you saying that abortion, uh, abortion is a great evil and has killed millions and broken millions of women. So we militate against it and we strive to uphold the sanctity of marriage and we push back on a, on a culture that's trying to force us into their mold. But doing justice for an oppressed people, whomever they might be, is just as close to the heart of God as those other things. Just as close. And we've just got, and, and if we believe the gospel, if we really believe the gospel, then we can say, okay, teach me, Lord. I don't understand. I don't get it, but I want to get it. So teach me. Because I'm loved. I'm already loved. See, he tells us to love kindness. Well, what would kindness look like to someone you have unwittingly oppressed? Maybe it's just listening. Perhaps it's standing against personal or institutional racism. Maybe it's just giving them a cup of cold water or a plate of Christmas cookies. I don't know what it is. You pray. And you ask God to help you what, know what it means to love your neighbor. And then we are to walk humbly with our God. To accept the gospel means that you walk with humility. You don't try to defend yourself or prove that you're better than you really are. You admit that all people have been created in the image of God and that all people with their differing cultural expressions are beloved by God. They're beloved by God. So they're different. Okay. Who made me right? We are beloved by God and just as valuable as, and just as valuable in your cultural expression. So express your culture. Now, that's a lot of law. And I have three minutes left, and I'm going to say to you, you fail terribly at doing this. And everybody said, there's only one person who has ever fulfilled this command. But we've got good news to believe and live out. We are forgiven. Brothers and sisters, if you come to God... Tonight, through the blood of Jesus Christ, it is my great good pleasure to say to you, you're forgiven. You are forgiven. You are loved. One day, we will have the heart and character of Jesus. Huh. Oh, you know, people... I wrote this book about, about heaven, you know, and then people were asking me, can I get a tan in heaven? And will my cat be there? And like, I wanted, I, I, it's just like, no, actually, the really good news is you're going to love God and your neighbor. And you won't even struggle at it. It'll be wonderful. 
my cat be there? No, actually not. We, <laughs> we are forgiven. We are loved. One day we will have the heart and character of Jesus and will truly love our neighbor in a completely just society. So pray now your kingdom come. See, that's what that means. Your kingdom come. Lord, bring in a just society. Begin with our works now to beautify the world to come. Bring it in, Lord, through us. We can rejoice. I'm going to read very quickly one passage from Luke 18. Never saw this verse before. <laughs> Who knew? There it was in Luke the whole time. <laughs> he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So pray. Your kingdom come. Bring it in, Lord. All this stuff we're talking about up here, you know, our hearts are warm. We really want it. Bring it in, Lord. In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared not God nor respected man. And there was a widow. I want you to get that, that it's a widow. It's a woman without any rights or standing, an oppressed person. There was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while, he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night. Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. So pray that. Pray that. Lord, however, you know, with whom, with whomever, however, bring in a just society, Lord, rebuild, do what you need to do, God, we're crying, we're crying that your kingdom would come and your will would be done. Father, this is our prayer. Hallowed be thy name. Let your kingdom come. Use us. And help us to persist in prayer and in godly, neighborly love. No matter how discouraged we might become. And help us to know that even in the midst of the fight, as we fail, you have loved us and made us your own. Build your kingdom. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.